Time is money, money is time in Disney World, so how can you keep from wasting both? We're gonna expose the biggest time and money wasters today here on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. Takes a lot of hard-earned time and money to create the Disney World vacation of your dreams, which means you don't need anything else attempting to take away even more time and money from you while you're already in the midst of your magical getaway. So we're gonna talk about the top money and time wasters that so many guests, including us, fall victim to in Disney World, because how do we know to warn you about these things if we haven't been there, done that, and regretted it ourselves? We're basically one big cautionary tale of a group around here. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, first one, buying those snacks just to throw them away. Picture this, you're in the Main Street confectionery over at Magic Kingdom. Everything looks good, from the Rice Krispies to the cookie pies to even the giant Mickey-shaped lollipops. So you buy a little treat for everyone in your group, just for fun. But after a few licks of the sucker and a few bites of the cookies, your group is already sweet treated out. Now you're stuck having to throw away $35 plus in snacks, even though most of each snack is still pretty much intact. And then you do this over and over and over again, all trip long. Well, Disney snacks are fun to taste test, but if you know your group is never gonna finish something, it's better to just buy one or two snacky items from each location instead of constantly wasting money on a snack for each individual. And if your kids aren't good sharers, well, they're gonna learn to share right now. <laughs> Only partially kidding. I know parenting lessons probably aren't the best to take for a test spin in the middle of literal Disney World, but you can always find a shareable snack option that still allows your kids to have their own snack portions and save yourself a few bucks as well as a few tiers. For example, if you get those cheeseburger spring roll cart, also in Magic Kingdom, each purchase comes with two rolls, so you can make one spring roll purchase and split it between two kids. Or if you bring collapsible storage containers with you in your park bag, you can pick up some popcorn or a popcorn mix at the Main Street Confectionery and split it between the bowls. One popcorn price, two separate portions, because they're really, really big popcorn portions. The same thing can be said for other savory portions like fried baskets or tater tot cups and corn dog nuggets from various locations. If you want your kids thinking they have their own snacks that they won't be forced to split with anyone, just dole them out between these two easy to store bowls and you'll be golden. Speaking of collapsible storage, these nifty little park bag items are another great way to save a snack when you're not quite done with it instead of completely throwing it out. That way, when you start to feel a little bit peckish later on, you can always retrieve that container and finish what you started. This is especially handy when you have to get on a ride and you're not allowed to take food on it. Plastic bags are also great to have on hand for this same reason and might be a better fit for those more awkward shaped candies like your oversized lollipops. Or if you want a real handy way to save your suckers, Disney's got a new item to help you out with that because they know the struggle is real. The lollipop saver can now be found in Magic Kingdom. You can get it for $11 at the Emporium on Main Street, USA. Personally, I'm just going to bring a Ziploc bag because $11 is a lot of money. Anyway, regardless of what you choose, hooray for no more wasteful sticky messes. Now, what about paying for lodging that you think will be cheaper, but really isn't? Disney World resorts are expensive, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, but sometimes an investment in a Disney hotel might actually save you money in the end. How? Well, because of what I said earlier, time is money in Disney World, and if you're wasting time trying to get around the parks, then you're inadvertently wasting money too. Hypothetical scenario, let's say you're about to take a Disney World vacation, and you're trying to choose between two lodging choices, an Airbnb for $150 per night, or a standard Pop Century resort room for $225 per night. At first, the Airbnb looks like the obvious choice. After all, you'll more than likely be booking a much bigger place to stay there, potentially a whole house or townhome for a cheaper rate than that little tiny room Disney's offering at their value hotel. Honestly, I could end the point right there. For some, the extra space and cheaper rate would seal the deal. But here's where Pop Century might end up still saving you in the end. Even when Airbnbs claim to be closer to the Disney World parks, they may still be quite a drive away. I mean, think about it. An Airbnb that claims to be just 15 minutes away from Disney World might still be around the main I-4 highway, and then you get caught on I-4 during those heavy periods of traffic, and you're looking at 30 to 40 minutes of extra drive time right there. And even if you want to avoid driving around the Orlando area altogether, many Airbnb locations don't offer up complimentary transportation to the parks like the Disney resorts are going to give you. When you stay at Pop Century, for instance, you're just a Skyliner ride away from both Epcot and Hollywood Studios. And to get to Animal Kingdom and Magic Kingdom, you'll just have to wait on a bus to take you up to the front of each park. Meanwhile, those who stay off Disney property are going to have to drive themselves everywhere, meaning you will be paying $30 per day to park at the theme park. 
works, or you'll have to pay for a rideshare service every day at a flex price to get you to where you need to go. Not to mention Airbnbs can also hit you with those sneaky added charges like cleaning fees and pool fees and pet fees and any other additional services that they might tack on to your bill, which might blindside you if you don't read that fine print. Now, this isn't a blanket statement where I'm telling you that y'all need to kick all Airbnb potentials to the curb because Airbnbs really can be the perfect fit for your group, especially if you're traveling with a bigger family and need more space to spread out at a lower cost. I mean, personal pool, right? But don't automatically assume the cheapest price tag you find on your lodgings is always the best option to spend your time and money on. By the way, if you want to take a deeper dive into all the Disney World resorts, you can scan the QR code you see on the screen right now or head to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash hotels after this. And we're going to send you a free list of all the different Disney resorts on site as well as rank them for you and give you bullet point pros and cons about each stay because even a hotel that's ranked lower on our list might still have the pros you're looking for and prove itself to be the right fit for you. All right, next way to waste your time and money in Disney World is getting an after hours ticket and not thinking about the repercussions. We've been singing the praises of Disney's after hour events quite a bit lately, but I think it's only fair we play devil's advocate today because after hours are not for everybody. But first, let's go over a super speedy recap of what these after hours consist of. Disney's after hours are separately ticketed events that happen at select parks on certain nights and allow event guests to hang out in the parks three hours past general closing time. These events boast drastically reduced crowds, rare character appearances, way shorter ride lines, and complimentary snacks. Plus, after hours guests are also allowed to enter the parks two to three hours before the event kicks off, even without a regular park day ticket, which means you won't have to miss out on the nighttime spectacular. That all sounds great, right? Well, let's look at this beyond the surface level now. First and foremost, after hours tickets tend to be the same price, if not more expensive, than a regular park day ticket, with event prices ranging between $149 and $175 per person. So that's about five to six hours in the park versus a typical 10 to 14 hours you would normally get with your regular day ticket. And sure, you could get a regular day ticket and an after hours ticket for the same day, but goodness, that means spending twice as much as you'd normally spend on an average park day visit for like a 15 to 20 hour park day which I know it's hard to leave the park after a fun-filled day, but that just sounds exhausting. And since we're on the subject of lethargy, that's another important factor you need to consider before taking the after-hours splurge. These events tend to kick off around 10 p.m. or 9.30 in Hollywood Studios' case, and last until 12.30 to 1 a.m. Of course, you're probably going to want your money's worth out of this event, so you're going to want to stay till the bitter end. But if you do that, then you have to factor in travel time on top of that, meaning you might not get back to your hotel or Airbnb be or wherever until 2 a.m. or later. Of course, having cooler temperatures and shorter lines and free snacks is a great combo for your kids, but if your kids are used to a certain sleep schedule, then an after-hours event could be setting them up for failure for the remainder of your vacation. Instead of wailing about the heat and long lines, they're just going to have a breakdown because they're so tired. And that's not just a kid problem, that's a grown-up problem too. I mean, if you're not getting to bed until 2 a.m. or later, are you really going to want to get up and around only a few hours later to get those 7 a.m. virtual queues or first lightning lane selections or get dressed and ready to take on the early theme park entry hours? Yeah, more than likely, you're going to need to schedule a break day after your after hours gallivanting. And finally, one last downside, and then I'll promise I'll return to team after hours again. While you will be able to ride most all the rides during after hours events, you're going to be missing out on that live entertainment that's available in the parks during the day. Now, this can be a tough choice when it comes to picking the Hollywood Studios after hours ticket versus getting a regular ticket, since there are so many Broadway style shows you can check out during the day, and you'll be missing out on those if you choose to go to the park after the public has left and gone to bed. So is after hours a scam? Not at all. I've heard tons of good things about this event from you in the comments, as well as from my own team and myself. But I just don't want everyone getting the impression that this is a one size fits all. Some groups will benefit from it, while some will find it to be a giant waste of time and money. So talk it over with your group, be very realistic about yourselves when it comes to how much sleep you need, and read that fine print and really think about whether this is the right fit for you or not. Now, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The Disney dining plan was not created to save you money. While you absolutely can get more than your money's worth out of this service if you play your cards right and order the highest end meals and snacks that are Disney dining plan credit eligible, this plan's original intent was to make dining around the parks more convenient, so you don't have to worry about paying out of pocket for any of your meals, except when it comes to gratuity and other enhancements you might want to add. But in order to really get your money's worth out of the Disney dining plan, 
you're gonna have to eat and eat and eat all day long. Remember, Disney's not gonna promote something that doesn't make them money. And that's the situation with the dining plan. They have done their research. They know how much people eat in their parks and their hotels. And so the dining plan is the top end of that. So they're making you pay for kind of the most food you could potentially eat. And then a lot of people don't actually eat that much food. So they're kind of getting a profit from that. Make sense? Okay. So let's go over the basics real quick. With a standard dining plan purchase, you're gonna receive one table service meal per night, one quick service meal per night, and a snack or non-alcoholic drink per night of your package, along with one resort refillable drink mug. Beverages are included with each of your meals. While guests under 21 years of age can choose from a variety of non-alcoholic bevies, guests 21 and older with valid identification can substitute their drink for a beer, wine, or cocktail. The cost of the dining plan is per guest per night at $94.28 per adult per night, ages 10 and up, and $29.69 per child per night, ages 3 to 9. This cost is added to the regular cost of a Disney World vacation package. So what does this purchase really mean for you and your family when all is said and done in terms of wasting time and money? Well, it could mean that you're set up for your dream trip. If your family loves spending a lot of time at those more high-end restaurants or character dining experiences, you love to get the steak, you love to get the lobster, then the standard Disney dining plan can help you devote a lot of your vacation itinerary to that. But if you're wanting to see as much as possible during each park day, the dining plan almost forces you to bring all your plans to a sudden halt so you can eat again. Because even if you're still full from your quick service lunch and afternoon stack, you're still gonna have to stop whatever you're doing in the park and spend an hour or so at whatever sit down restaurant you booked to make sure you don't waste your table service credit. Even the quick service dining plan option, which will give you two quick service credits instead of a quick service and a table service credit for a cheaper prepaid price point, may offer you a little more flexibility in the end, but you're still gonna be essentially locked in to how you need to eat. Say you're at Epcot, for instance, and you decide you'd rather taste your way around the festival that's currently happening rather than sit down for a bit and eat a quick service meal. That's fine, but you've still got those two quick service dining credits you'll need to use at some point if you want to avoid losing them. You can always push those credits around a little bit, but that can mean tripling up on your quick service meals on two other park days. This isn't a game of checkers. We're having to play chess here. Now, in the end, the Disney dining plan may not be worth the money you put into it just because of the time commitment alone. But I don't want to completely undermine this option either because it really can be the right fit for a lot of folks. You're just going to need to study up on the pros and cons of the service before making that final decision. Which, lucky for you, we got a guidebook about it. <laughs> the DFB Guide to Maximizing the Disney Dining Plan. It's been a while, but we finally wrote it. That's gonna answer those main questions that you might still have about the Disney Dining Plan, including detailed example days and cost breakdowns so you can visualize exactly how these credits can be used to their fullest. The DDP Guidebook is already currently for sale on our site right now. You can add an extra discount to your total purchase by typing in code YouTube before you check out. So DFB is a team made up of people who just really love Disney, no matter how many times we've been before. And while, yes, we do have friends and family members who share the sentiment, not everyone in our lives is as gung-ho about a Disney vacation as we are. And when you take a non-Disney person inside your happy place, well, it might not be as happy as it used to be. Instead of merrily munching on our favorite snacks and singing along with the fireworks shows and laughing at that guy in Monsters Inc. laugh for at Magic Kingdom because that joke never gets old, we suddenly find ourselves kind of on high alert. Does this person like Dole Whip as much as me or have I been overselling it? Am I making a fool out of myself for crying in front of them during Luminous at Epcot? Will they have the audacity to call living with the land boring? Now, Disney World puts relationships to the test, and I get it. You want that special someone in your life to love Disney as much as you do. But just because they don't doesn't mean they're not a bad person, right? <laughs> I mean, Disney really isn't for everyone. It's expensive, it's hot, it's busy, it's a big time commitment, and it's exhausting. But if it's something that you enjoy, don't diminish that joy for yourself by forcing someone to tag along whose heart isn't in it. Find a buddy who will be excited to take on the parks with you or plan a solo trip for yourself, because those are super fun too, and the only person you have to worry about on that vacation is you. So if you just so happen to be the person who's being roped into the Disney World trip you're not super thrilled about, first of all, hi, thanks for being here, clicking on this video. Since you're with us here today, I can already tell you're trying to appease the Disney fan in your life. Or you saw the title of this video and you're developing arguments to get yourself out of the trip. Either way, happy to have you. But if you are indeed going to Disney soon and you're not super excited with the idea of it all, 
Here's my two cents again. Give it a chance. You don't have to love it. You don't have to want to go back every other year for the rest of your life. But there are places around the Disney World property where you can go that aren't nearly as Disney-fied as you might think. For example, the World Showcase in Epcot is basically a sample platter of 11 different countries, each with their own architecture and drinks and eats and gift shops and entertainment based around their respective countries. It's done really well. It's worth a visit. Animal Kingdom has these awesome walking trails that are peaceful, beautifully kept, and give you an up-close look at a lot of wildlife. The Disney Springs Shopping District is free to explore, has lots of different places where you can dine and shop or maybe catch a movie. The Disney resorts have different themes made to fit the vacation vibe you're after. So if you want more of a New Orleans style vibe, hit up Port Orleans French Quarter. Or if you want to escape to Europe for a bit, head to the Riviera. Looking for a Mexican inspired getaway? Coronado Springs could be your place. Disney even has professional golf courses on property if you want to spend the afternoon out on the putting greens. Now, if any of that sounds good to you, talk it over with your travel group and let your wishes be known. Even if this wasn't your first vacation choice, it's still your vacation too, so your priorities should be thrown into the mix just as much as everyone else's. After all, if you're helping to pay for this, you might as well enjoy it. Plus, something tells me the Disney fan in your family will be thrilled to hear that there's something you actually are excited to experience once you're out there, so open the conversation and allow yourself to get excited about the trip, even if that means getting excited about the more non-conventional stuff. So Disney's add-ons like Genie Plus, Park Hoppers, Memory Maker are already a risky splurge as is. You might find that you don't really need lightning lanes because the crowds aren't too bad. Or you may not end up wanting to hop between parks each day of your trip, or you could end up not taking enough PhotoPass pictures to make that extra Memory Maker cost worth the money. But these risky splurges will always wind up being a waste of money if you wait too late before making that gamble. For Disney Genie Plus, your best bet for using and taking full advantage of this service is to purchase it as soon as you can, which is anytime after midnight on the day of your park visit. You'll also want to make sure you have that add-on purchased before 7 a.m. since that's when you'll be able to make your first lightning lane selection of the day. But if you decide to sleep in or you decide that you're going to head to the park first and then scope out the situation to see if you really need those lightning lanes to help you bypass the main ride lines, you might find yourself in a rather sticky situation. Because lightning lanes, yeah, they book up. So the later you wait to get Genie Plus, the higher the disadvantage you could experience. Experience. Buying Genie Plus later also means you're not going to be able to use that 120 minute rule to its fullest either. Normally, you're only able to book your next lightning lane after you use the last one, but you can also book your next lightning lane after a two hour kind of cool down period. So if you book a lightning lane for like Jungle Cruise in Magic Kingdom and the return time isn't for another three or four hours, you'll still be able to stack up a lightning lane reservation to make a second selection after 120 minutes have passed. And that's why it's better to purchase and start using your Genie Plus as early as you can on the day of your visit to get the most bang for your buck. Otherwise, you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you wait until the afternoon to finally add it onto your park day. For park hopper add-ons, you're going to be given the option to tack those onto your regular day park tickets when you're purchasing them on the Disney World website or My Disney Experience app. But if you're on the fence about whether or not you want to jump between parks each day of your trip, you're more than welcome to wait it out a bit and make a final decision once you're in the Disney bubble. But here's the thing, when it comes to park hoppers, it's all or nothing. So let's say you decide to add on the park hopper perk when you're on day three of your four park ticket. Sure, you'll now have park hopper privileges for days three and four of your trip, but you're also still gonna have to pay for that park hopper add-on for days one and two of your trip too, even though they've already passed. I know, right? So essentially, you'll be forced to pay $65 per person per day for two days worth of park hoppers that you can't even use. That means you'll want to make sure you make that park hopper purchase if you want it before your first park day commences. And then there's the oh so controversial Memory Maker. If you purchase Memory Maker before your trip so you can have access to all the photo pass pictures you take during your theme park visits, then you'll pay $185 for the whole thing. But if you wait to purchase it until after your trip, the cost of Memory Maker goes up to $210. Okay, great. You might be thinking you'll just purchase it early and avoid the upcharge. Easy peasy. But could I offer you an alternative solution? <laughs> Maybe you should skip the Memory Maker purchase altogether? Memory Maker is not only expensive, but it does force your family to stop and wait in line for PhotoPass picture ops over and over again. And just speaking from personal experience here, you're more than likely not going to want every PhotoPass picture you take. I can't tell you how many photo pass pictures I've taken where I looked at myself afterwards and went, yeah, that's okay. I'd rather not remember that moment when I was a sweaty, sleepy mess of a person. Thank you. On the Disney World website, you'll have the option to pay for 
individual PhotoPass photos for a whole lot less money, 20 bucks instead of 200 bucks. Or you can always ask a PhotoPass cast member to take your family's photo in front of the castle or other iconic Disney park centerpiece while using your own phone for free and they'll still do a bang up job. I'm pretty sure my Facebook profile right now is a picture that a cast member took with my phone of me and my friend in front of the tree of life. And that didn't cost me anything. Though some may argue that the memory captured is priceless. Oh, and don't forget, if you go ahead and purchase Genie Plus for your park visit, you'll also get complimentary PhotoPass downloads of all those in-ride photos that you take throughout the day. So you might still be able to get a few PhotoPass pics without having to pay anything extra, except for what you'll pay to use Genie Plus. Next way to waste your time and money in Disney World, pushing yourself too far. Okay, guilty party over here. You know that we have made all the mistakes and our whole job is to help you not make the same ones, right? So when you only have so much time in Orlando, it's easy to wanna pack in as much as you possibly can without giving yourself a chance to come up for air. Break day, what break day? You've got four Disney parks to conquer, plus possibly some of the other Orlando parks too, like over in Universal or SeaWorld or Legoland. Anyone feeling called out yet? While a jam-packed Orlando vacation sounds like a dream come true, let me just speak for the group when I say that the third day park slump is real. If you hit the ground running on days one and two, staying in the parks from sunup till sundown, then your group is apt to lose their vacation adrenaline for the second leg of the trip. And that's not a fantastic situation when you've already purchased the park tickets. So here's how you can force yourself to take a break, even in the middle of a super busy theme park spree. Option one, schedule in some pool time. If you're staying at a Disney World resort, you're gonna have some really cool pools to take advantage of. And while back-to-back -back park days may seem like a surefire way to win your kids over, many times they tend to enjoy splashing around in the water even more than the parks themselves, especially if they're tired or it's been a very, very stimulating couple of days. So make sure to factor in some much needed lounge days by the pool to get off your feet and out of the ride lines for a while. Second option, seek out the shows. Some Disney World shows happen out in the open, but some actually take place in a nice indoor air conditioned theater. These are the shows you're gonna want to really prioritize during the day. Not only are they included with the price of park admission, but they're gonna give you the chance to experience that theme park entertainment while giving your feet a break. So go to these shows, which usually don't have very long lines, right at the peak ride line time. So right there at like 11 a.m., 12, 1 p.m., you know, when things are really crowded. Also, I'm not going to lie. My family was doing a rope drop to park close one day and we were just really dragging. And we went into a quick service. Look, I think it was a restaurant, Asaurus. We sat down, we had a meal, we kind of checked email, looked at our phones for a little bit, just had a couple of, you know, sodas and some food. And we honestly felt completely refreshed just being in that AC for a little while and getting off of our feet. So it really can do wonders. Even if you don't want to, you know, schedule a whole pool day, just give yourself a break time. And option three, don't be afraid to actually leave. If the parks are getting a little too crowded or busy and exhausting, the good news is that you can leave the parks whenever you want to, take a breather, and then return to them later on after a much needed break when everyone else is starting to leave and probably melting down. And you get to come in when it's cooler and the ride lines are shorter, and that's great. Now, here's a good example. Magic Kingdom is only a monorail ride away from three deluxe resorts, Polynesian Village, Grand Floridian, and Contemporary. Each of these resorts has a solid mix of restaurants and lounges and leisure activities that all folks can take part in, even if you're not staying there as a hotel guest yourself. So maybe book a table service meal for dinner at one of these spots or for lunch or head over and just, you know, lay in one of those Polynesian village resort hammocks on the beach for a little while, get yourself a drink and just take a little nap. Now, this next one is an AJ versus Bria showdown. In one corner is me, AJ, hi, who is pro individual lightning lanes. And in the other corner, we have Bria who would rather spend her money elsewhere. Are we ready? For the record, I'm not exactly anti-individual lightning lanes. After all, I recognize that this is one of those surefire ways to guarantee your ride on a virtual queue attraction like Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in Epcot or Tron Light Cycle Run in Magic Kingdom, instead of having to stress over not getting into a virtual queue boarding group before they book up solid. I get it, I know AJ is going to bring that up in her arguments. However, I sometimes have a hard time wrapping my mind around paying a ton of money for an individual lightning lane, which will only give you the opportunity to skip the line of one specific Disney ride 
ride once. Like Seven Dwarves Mine Train, for instance, over in Magic Kingdom. As I'm writing this script today, Seven Dwarves Mine Train's individual lightning lanes are $11. Now, if I'm just paying for me, that's fine. I can splurge $11, no problem. But if I've got a family of four with me, that's $44 to skip over the main line of this little family coaster that's maybe two minutes long. Meanwhile, I could have just cut down my weight for free by hitting this one up during the Happily Ever After fireworks or coming here first thing during that early theme park entry time for a Disney hotel guest only, or by getting in line for it right before the park closes for the night. I do realize the title of this video is Ways to Waste Your Time and Money, and I do recognize that individual lightning lanes will actually help you save time even if that will cost you a pretty penny in the end. But on the flip side of that, they don't always save you time. A member of our team recently purchased an individual lightning lane for Cosmic Rewind, and she still ended up waiting almost an hour before finally getting to board the ride. And this doesn't seem to be an isolated case either. A few of you in the comments have mentioned that you've purchased Cosmic Rewind or Tron individual lightning lanes in the past and you've still found yourself waiting over 40 plus minutes to board the ride. So just to wrap up my thoughts here, I am definitely not fully against individual lightning lanes because I think they can be handy, but on occasion, they can end up letting you down. I just don't want y'all thinking that these little guys are 100% foolproof Otherwise, you might wind up pretty disappointed by the end results. Okay, so as Bria said, she's not fully against individual lightning lanes because she knows as well as I do that they are critical and important to you having a good Disney World vacation, right? Right, okay. So point one of my rebuttal, we gotta go back to the time is money argument. That's a big one. I don't live in Orlando. I live in Dallas, Texas. So when I go to Disney World, I'm only there for a couple of days and I got to get everything done. Now you're already paying so much to go to Disney in the first place. So if you're waiting for say Seven Dwarfs Mine Train and it's getting up to two to three hours and it's going to be hot and eat up a lot of park time and make your party cranky and yeah, forking over 44 bucks might be well worth it in the grand scheme of things if this is a priority ride for you. Point two, if you miss your chance at a virtual queue for Tron or Cosmic Rewind, this is it, man. This is your guarantee to still be able to ride this ride. And the best part is that you can choose when you ride. So instead of waiting for them to call your virtual queue all day long and basically having to, you know, be careful that you're not doing anything critical in case they call that virtual queue, you know exactly when you're gonna ride. You're gonna ride Tron at night because you chose the nighttime ride so you know you're gonna get the best experience, right? Or you're gonna ride Cosmic Rewind right before you go and have a nice dinner in World Showcase. You get to choose your time, that's great. And if this is your one and only Disney World trip with your family, paying 50 bucks for an individual lightning lane for everybody is a whole lot less expensive than paying for a whole other park day to try to get on those rides again. Point three, I mean, if you've already saved that money in the first place, you can choose this route instead of going the souvenir route. Think about it. A pair of mini ears nowadays costs like 30 to $40, if not more. For a couple extra bucks, I could skip over a ride line instead and save myself a few extra hours in the park. Time is money. Extra hours in the park means I get to do a whole bunch of other things instead of have a pair of mini ears that what am I going to do with them when I get home, right? Sign me up for the individual lightning lane. Okay, I'm going to call myself out here on the buyer's regret point. Disney World has a lot of different souvenirs and knickknacks for you to collect from park to park to park, right? We just talked about those mini ears. Mugs and kitchen utensils, spirit jerseys, hats, pins, lounge flies, those little lightsaber keychains that make you look like you stole it off a tiny Jedi. But here's the thing. Oftentimes you can find similar, if not the very same items that you're taking the time to buy in the parks available online for, get this, a discounted price. Be sure to scope out which DisneyStore.com sales can lead to the biggest savings before you head into the parks. That way, you'll know whether or not that lounge fly you're currently eyeballing on the store shelf is going to be cheaper if you just get it through the Disney Store website in one of their sales. You may also find fun Disney toy and accessory options for way cheaper at places like Target and Walmart or Amazon. And if you're looking to buy items for the little ones in your group, they don't know the difference. Steer them away from the overpriced stuff. Consider buying them some souvenirs from cheaper spots online or locally ahead of your trip. Then you can pack those items with you and during the trip, you can take them out as a fun and much more affordable surprise. I used to actually wrap up little you know, toys that I got at the dollar store or whatever for my son when we went to Disney World. And so every time he saw something he wanted, I'd take out this little wrapped present for him and he was placated. 
And just like that, your Disney World time and money have been saved. Hooray! Now, don't forget, if you want a free guide detailing all the different Disney World hotels, including their full pros and cons lists, be sure to head to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash hotels so we can send it to your email faster than you can say bibbity bobbity boo I have actually stayed at all the hotels. It's honestly probably my biggest accomplishment in my whole life. <laughs> I love that I've been able to do that. And so hopefully that experience will be really helpful for you. So thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ and Bria for Disney Food Blog. And we'll see you real soon. 